Hello, this is Robert McMullen, MD. I'm a psychiatrist. I went to Georgetown Medical School in Columbia Presbyterian for psychiatry residency. And I want to talk about when and why antidepressants don't work. Sometimes you just need to try combining one antidepressant with another. Uh, I think often you should not switch antidepressants very often. J. Amsterdam in Philadelphia a long time ago pointed out that our using multiple different antidepressants may actually be making patients worse, that they may be getting more resistant to the treatment. Now, it could be argued that the many different antidepressants have been uh, used because the, pa the patient is so ill and has such treatment-resistant depression. But he thinks there's an alternative situation is that we're making them worse. And I think he may be right. If, if the first antidepressant has some benefit, maybe not terrific, but some, my leaning is just to add on to that. And the, usually the most valuable thing is if you're using a serotonin type medicine is to add a different type of antidepressant like Wellbutrin, well, Bupropion. And uh, the combination of Zoloft and Wellbutrin, they used to call it Welloft as sort of a joke, but they just work together very well. Now, if they're still not working, then perhaps the next thing to do is to go to an MAO inhibitor. MAO inhibitors are the most powerful antidepressants there are. They work better than everything else. Unless the first thing's working really well, then, then it's not going to work better than that. But it's, it's got a higher chance of, of working. And sometimes they work uh, especially well in people that have atypical symptoms of depression that instead of having insomnia, they have hypersomnia and sleep too much. And, uh, and instead of losing weight and losing appetite, they have an increased appetite and gain weight during depression. And they tend to be rejection sensitive, that they'll go into a big depression if there's a romantic disappointment, or if they get criticized it'll, about some little thing, they'll, they'll, it'll sort of ruin their day. Those are what we call atypicals, and, and they often do better with an MAO inhibitor. Now, another thing that uh, causes us to not be able to get people out of depression is that the person is actually slightly bipolar. 10% of the population has chronic depression, either all the time or they're occasionally fluctuating into a depression and out. You know, so in their life, depression's given them uh, some trouble. And then maybe 25% of us have had at least one major depression in our life, maybe just one and uh, after some uh, major trauma or something. <clears throat> but about half of those people are a little bipolar, that they've had little highs or they've gotten uh, very excited about a project and so for two or three weeks they're really focused on that project and they're only sleeping six or seven hours instead of eight and they still have a lot of energy and they're thinking very clearly and maybe talking a little faster and maybe their self-esteem is better than normal and they, they feel really good and uh, that's often a mild high or that they're a little explosive and they get angry at times and agitated and angry and, and that's also uh, sometimes a sign of bipolarity another big sign is the antidepressants not working or that you put someone on an antidepressant and it works really well or fairly well, but then a few months later it stops working. Then that person is often a little bipolar. And then you, uh, then you need to start doing other things. And a major thing is sometimes just to take them off the antidepressants. And some of these really treatment-resistant people on multiple medicines and antidepressants never work that well. If you just take them off of everything, uh, sometimes they'll just start improving on their own. It may take you know six months or a year, but they may get better and better. Uh, there's other things you need to do 
to look into that may be contributing. I won't get into all of them because there's many of them, but one should have blood tests to find out if the, if the B12 is low or if somebody is slightly low uh, on their uh, thyroid. Joseph Goldberg once said, and, and he, everything he says, he's a researcher, is based on research. He said that the biggest predictor of people who didn't come out of major depression is for their TSH to be above 2.5. Without going into a long explanation, uh, 2.5 is, is uh, in the normal range. And if it's higher than 2.5, then it's like you're, you could be, you could call it slightly hypothyroid. But in any case, adding thyroid hormone is is more indicated in that case, although adding thyroid hormone, if it's cytomel, uh, which is T3, uh, can help anybody in depression. And another thing to check is the MTHFR gene. If you have a, a sort of abnormality of that gene, which is very common, then that predicts that if you take the active folate vitamin, it's, called, it's got a long name, unfortunately, L-methylfolate, 15 milligrams a day, that that will help depression. It, it can help depression in anybody, but particularly if, uh, if you're homozygous for the C677T gene. Uh, now, the other thing is... Uh, to make a major change in the medication to things that are called mood stabilizers. And this is always a problem, uh, or most of the time it's a problem with my patients because since they have a depression, they want to take an, something that's labeled an antidepressant. Just because we label something, uh, it really affects how we think about it. So nobody paid much attention to vitamin D for years because it's called a vitamin when it's actually a steroid hormone. And th there's many things that, uh, that were affected by the name. And TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, the scientists, the researchers, they never really did much research on it because it's called thyroid stimulating hormone. So they, they assume that's what it does only. But it actually, there's receptors in every cell in the body for, for TSH and TSH does a lot of other things besides stimulate the thyroid. But the name even uh, put the scientist off course with it. Well, likewise with antidepressants. And I try to tell people that uh, the, the name doesn't matter, it's what it does. And low-dose lithium, lamotrigine, lamictal, that originally came out as a seizure medic, anti-seizure medication, Depakote, usually in low doses, and it also originally came out as an anti-seizure medication. These are called mood stabilizers, but the main thing they do is actually lift depression. They're, they're not so good at stopping the highs. And Depakote is better at lifting depression than it is at preventing highs. The, uh, and then other things, uh, such as a lot of exercise, socializing more, seeing friends, and adding a lot of different nutrients. Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, I add in a lot of fish oil, like six or 10 pills a day. But if, it, if I can't prove it works, you know, at, at some point then I just tell the patient they can stop it because they, they get tired of taking all that. But if they don't mind, they could continue taking a few a day because it also really reduces heart attacks. So there's all sorts of things you can do. So, but I have a question. So, you ever met a patient that you cannot cure from depression or cannot, you know, get into almost a normal? The, all the antidepressants and everything, nothing work on it? On it? Yes, I frequently have had people who who just did not respond to antidepressants at all, and I tried everything, uh, and and uh, and that's why I got uh, the TMS, the transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
because quite a lot of those people will respond to that. That's a magnetic field going on and off, and it goes right through your skull. And, and you can uh, excite the brain under there a little bit or, or inhibit it a little bit if you do it on the right. And that has a big antidepressant effect in many people. And since it's a completely different way of going about it, you really have a high proportion of even the treatment-resistant people who uh, respond. And uh, there's also a vagal nerve stimulator. It's an implant that goes to the vagus nerve. And then every uh, five minutes, there's a 30-second period where there's a little electricity going up the vagus nerve. And during that 30 seconds, you're, you're uh, a little hoarse, and you can feel it. But after a while, other people can't hear it. And interestingly, that takes often a few months to work, you know, at least three months. And there's been a few people that didn't get better for a year. But it's easy to keep them on it because uh, it's in there, you know. And, uh, and it's very hard to have people keep taking medication for a long period when it's not working. However, I think there are people and medicines that will work with time if you could just keep doing it. For example, I had a fellow a long time ago, who was about 35 or something, and he was painfully depressed all his life. He didn't respond to any medicine. He'd go to a bar with his friends and they'd laugh and joke, and he says, I can see them smiling and laughing and enjoying themselves, but I don't even know what that feels like. And I tried lots of stuff. Uh, and, and then I said, you know, the only medicine that um, you haven't had any side effects at all and been easy, easy to take was this nortriptyline. So why don't you just stay on it? And he moved to San Francisco. And then a couple of years later, he came back to me. And he walks in. And he's normal. He's not depressed at all. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, I just kept taking that nortriptyline. And after a year or two, I just started feeling better and better. And then I just came up to normal. And then I got a job as a cub reporter on the, on the San Francisco Chronicle and, uh, and began to work full time for the first time in his life. And he had a lot of friends and he felt good. And uh, he wanted to know what to do. <laughs> And uh, I don't know whether he spontaneously remitted or whether the medicine did it. I, I, would ex I would think that the medicine probably did it, considering his history. But I think uh, sometimes other medicines will gradually work. Uh, I think particularly things like Depakote, Lamictal, and Lithium. And uh, Lithium in particular, that we're finding out that sometimes even very low doses like 150 milligrams a day where somebody who's manic depressive maybe takes 1200. 150, you don't have to monitor any blood, you don't have to do any blood tests. And, uh, and usually there's you know, uh, no side effects at all. You don't feel anything at that dose. And surprisingly, I've had about 37 people that had a big antidepressant effect within uh, two weeks. And they were already functioning at 80 or 90 percent, but they just said, I just feel better. I feel more stable, more resilient. And then when these in-laws and family members give me a lot of trouble, I don't take it so personally. I just feel better. And then it can, and they continue to feel better. But we also think that there's some people that stay on some lithium that if two years later or a year later, they're doing better than they ever have and are feeling really good, it may actually be from that low dose of lithium. I have a few people I've treated 20, 30 years, and then I was thinking, they, must, they were much more depressed in the past. They always dragged in and weren't feeling that good, and I'd be trying different things, but very rarely did they feel really normal, you find me. In the last two or three years, he's pretty normal. He's enjoying life, he's got a good relationship, he liked, he's uh, enjoying his work, he just, he feels fine. This wasn't the way he was all those years before. And then I look at the chart and I see that six months or a year before this good period started was when I started him on lithium. And, uh, and sometimes I just 
you know, I just try to get people to take a low dose. It, it prevents Alzheimer's. So when, when somebody gets up close to 60, they should definitely be taking 150 a day. <coughs> and, uh, but many of those people were also a little depressed, so they got better. And, uh, and sometimes I'll put, uh, with one person I'm thinking of, that uh, his mother was manic depressive. And even though he didn't have hardly any signs of bipolarity, and he was doing 80 or 90 percent of normal on the medicines he was on, I just thought adding a very tiny amount of lithium might make a difference. And is that lithium the reason that a year or two later he just became normal and stayed normal? I don't know. And it's hard to do a study on it, but it certainly can't hurt. Anyway, this is Robert McMullen. I'm a psychiatrist and uh, I've just been talking about uh, antidepressants and uh, a little bit about why they may not work and, uh, and what to do. And it's actually a pretty complicated question because there's so many things you need to look at in uh, blood tests and uh, their history and so many different things to try until you find something that works. But you should keep trying. Did you have a